vaccines or taking out atypical or malignant ones. And there seems to be a small group of patients we do see who are keen on non-operative approaches of handling their tumors. So we are now interested in uh, finding out which tumors would be suitable for this type of ablation and uh, what are the indications, the techniques that you use, uh, the potential complications and uh, how we avoid them. And uh, you have that in to nine years. Namaste, Professor Paul. I'm Julie. Hello, uh, I'm hi, Julie. Julie. Namaste. Hi, sir. Namaste, namaste, namaste. And so, so today we are very uh, honored. So also we invite uh, Dr. Bullen uh, for this uh, uh, for this microwave ablation on thyroid and the breast. Hi, Dr. Bullen. Hi, thank you. Hello. <laughs> thank you, thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, we have yeah. Uh, here, here we have our our inter, uh, international department uh, director, Mr. Calvin. Calvin, can you? Hello. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Mm. Nice to meet you, everyone. And good morning. Yes, I'm Paul here from Lopland, and Neem is here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, we also have our colleagues from uh, marketing department, uh, Ms. Nate and the Sky. Good morning. Good morning, dear professor. Morning. And we also have our colleagues from South Asia, UK, and Ireland. Okay, so uh, let us start today's meeting. Um, good morning, everyone. And today we're so glad, uh, we're so glad to invite Dr. Bullen to join our meeting. And, uh, and then, uh, our professor Bullen will give the, our, uh, an introduction about the thyroid ablation. So, uh, Professor Bullen, if you are ready, uh, you can uh, share your screen and start your presentation. Okay, can I start, Professor Paul? Yes, please, go ahead, yes. yes. Thank, you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, do you have any questions? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you see you my slides now? The beginning slides. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, I begin. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Bülent from Antalya, Turkey. Today, I will share with you a microablation of thyroid nodules. And uh, this is my hospital. Uh, where I work in Antalya. It is a research and training hospital. We have here approximately around 1,560 beds and 1,200 doctors in my hospital. Uh, we begin to uh, thyroid thermoablation in my clinic since 2015. We have approximately 4,000 thyroid thermal ablation cases. And we published about thyroid microwave ablation eight research papers. And we uh, perform in my clinic 19 workshops about thyroid ablation and 40 national and 86 international doctors attend to this course. This is some uh, photos of my workshops in my clinic. And this is some uh, webinars that I attend. And here are my uh, research papers about thyroid microwave ablations. 
Uh, I will share you most of the important. First is microwave ablation as an efficient therapy for primary hyperparatism, efficient of treatment success. And uh, we, the rate was 87% in primary parathyroid adenomas. The other uh, research paper from your clinic is microwave ablation of autonome function thyroid nodule, a comparative study with radioactive iodine therapy on functional treatment success. And we have the both effective treatment success with ra- radioactive iod therapy, but the advantage of microwave ablation is we uh, in, in never uh, patients develop hypothyroidism, but in seven of 35 patients, that treated with radioactive eotherapy, we see in this patient group hypothyroidism. And this is another paper. In this paper, uh, we uh, investigate the short and long-term effects on thyroid function tests, thyroglobulin and thyroid antibodies, after ablation of symptomatic benign uh, thyroid nodules. And we don't found any changes, only the first uh, 24 hours is very important. Uh, sometimes the thyroid uh, functions are changed. Okay, what's thyroid uh, thermoablation? The goal is to elevate tissue temperatures and not to create zones of irreversible cellular damage. And thermal ablation heats tissue to cytotoxic level through which cell death is caused. Afterwards, the created coagulative necrosis mm. is degraded, no, degraded no. by the patient's own immune system. The optimum heat is between 60 and 100 uh, Celsius. And if we use uh, this optimum heat, we see on the benign thyroid nodule cytotoxic effect, cell death, coagulative necrosis, and the, this, uh, the coagulative necrosis destroyed and fagocytate by the immune but system. Is- but if we use above 100 Celsius, this is very important, then occur carbonization. And it can't be phagocytate by a macrophage. Therefore, it is very important that we use the heat between 60 and 100 Celsius. Uh, As we know, microwave uh, ablation is an electromagnetic field around the percutaneous antenna and rotating the water molecules in the tissue around their axis three, four billion times per second and kinetic energy and heat consist. We use echo generators in microwave ablations. It produces between 1 and 200 watts in 2,450 megahertz. But in uh, liver or in lung or in bone ablation, we use some uh, between uh, 50 and 70 watts. But in thyroid ablation, your maximum watt must be 30 watts. We must use low watts in thyroid ablation. This is very important to minimize the tissue sharing in thyroid ablation. This is the, this is the antenna of uh, <laughs> thyroid ablation. And this is diff- uh, <laughs> and this is uh, different of antennas that we use in liver and lung ablation. The active tip is 3.5 millimeters. And we have a distilled water. It circulates through the dual channels. And what is the difference between microwave ablation and radio fe- frequency ablations? The, the difference is. Sorry. Yes. Uh, from causing disturbance. Really, really, of the other really sorry for the for the disturbing. Yeah, we already mute. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, the other people really sorry, really sorry for the introduction, inter, uh, interruption. And uh, sir, please go on, Dr. Blunt, you can go on. Okay. Thank you. And yeah. uh, here are, we see the effects of uh, microwave ablation and radio frequency ablation. In microwave ablation, uh, direct heating is dominant and the thermal conductance is very less. In RFA, the direct heating is not the dominant and the thermal conductance is uh, more dominant. What mean this? This mean uh, this is this mean that microablation is more safe because the thermal conductance is very less. 
And with it, what is the advantage of RFA compared to microwave? Uh, target ablation begin with RFA. Most of the antenna uh, are more thinner. It works according to the tissue impedance, and uh, it goes up to maximum of 800 ohms. And above 800 ohms, the tissue carbonization occurs. In RFA, uh, the machine stops automatically, and this is a protective effect uh, of uh, carbonization. And uh, while it's begin with uh, RFA thyroid um, uh, ablation, uh, we have more experience. But since five years, we begin to uh, microwave ablation. And what is the advantage of microwave ablation? Firstly, in larger ablated tissue volumes, we, uh, we ablated more larger ablated tissue volumes in the same time, two times more, and optimal heating and cystic nodule, especially in hypervascular toxic nodules, in toxic adenomas. At the procedure, we have less pain. Why? Because we don't use any ionic current passing through the body, as in RFA. And tissue impedance doesn't matter. We can ablate it. Any, uh, the internal structure is not important, but it has not an inhibitory effect on preventing carbonization. And we can use microwave ablation in any group of patients, in pregnant patients, in patients that have heart pacemakers, joint prostheses, and teeth implants. Here are some guidelines, Korean, Italian, uh, and uh, European guideline. In this guideline, indications are symptomatic or cosmetic problems that uh, thyroid nodules, non-functional nodules, some cystic nodules, autonomic uh, uh, functional toxic nodules. And in this, most of guidelines, uh, they need they say it, uh, they, that they need uh, required two biopsies. But my experience is if you have biopsy in the last three months, it is enough for thyroid ablation. And these indications are the, for my clinic. Uh, firstly, cystic nodules that contains 20 percent more solid compounds because if a cystic nodules uh, compare more than 20 more than solid compounds if we use in this type of uh, nodules alcohol ablations the recurrence rate are between 26 and 38 percent therefore in these cases i uh, do a hybrid treatment firstly i aspirate the fluid then i do alcohol ablation and the end and i uh, to thermal ablation with microwave ablation. Second are solid and mixed tip nodules under 30 cc. If the nodule size is above 30 cc, most of these cases need a second season treatment. Autonome toxic nodules, growing nodules, thyroid nodule that have previous thyroid surgery. This cases group are sending mostly from the surgeons because uh, in these cases, the recurrent laryngeal nerve cores are changed and Therefore, uh, the surgeons don't want to touch these patients again, and they send to us parathyroid adenomas, papillary microcarcinomas, the classical variant, and patients at risk of general anesthesia. Here, are a, here is a paper of uh, China, and uh, they follow up in three years the effect of microablation of benign thyroid nodules, and they found in predominant cystic nodules are the volume reduction rates, the shrinkage rates, more than the solids. And here's another uh, paper from China. And in this nodule, the main cystic nodules, uh, volume shrinkage rates are better than the simple solid nodules. And here are uh, paper, another research paper, and we compare here the symptomatic uh, and cosmetic scores between radio uh, frequency ablation and microwave, and uh, we don't found any difference. Risk assessment in thyroid ablation. Firstly, uh, if we do any uh, thyroid ablation, patient must be atroid. But in some hypervascular nodules, 5% in toxic adenomas may present as atroid. In these patients, if we see in the ultrasound investigation, if we see the contralateral thyroid lobes atrophic, then maybe it can be a toxic adenoma and we must request a thyroid scintigraphy. And another important thing is, in hypervascular solid nodules, after ablation, the thyroid globulin levels may be increased significantly due to the destruction of the follicular cells in the ablation nodule and sometimes occur thyrotoxicosis. Therefore, it is very important to make a consultation with 
uh, endocrinology and prepare the pa patients. Mostly we begin in this patient group, thyromizole 5 milligram before one week to uh, avoid these complications. Another group is patients with thyroiditis. Patients with high thyroid antibodies in this group, sometimes after ablations, release of antigenic materials such uh, T such release from follicular thyroid cells triggers autoimmune inflammatory process, autoimmune hypertrophism gravis. I don't see this ever, but my experiences in this patient group, why this patient group have an inflammation at the procedure and after the procedure, most of these patients have pain and swelling. Therefore, if a patient has high thyroid antibodies, I don't agree to this patient group. And before ablation, we must carefully evaluate uh, the anatomy. Normally, uh, we have a term like danger triangle. This is a tracheoesophageal growth. And in this uh, uh, area, uh, normally we see the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Another is the nervous vagus and middle sympathetic ganglion. But now the danger triangle uh, concept are changed. Normally, we the concept of a danger triangle was proposed to describe an area between the esophagus, trachea, and the medial portion of the thyroid gland. But now we have a new concept. This is danger zone. What means this? Why the recurrent laryngeal nerve have many different variations. Sometimes, uh, especially after the uh, thyroid surgery, and therefore we have a new uh, white area and. Uh, nervous vagus have same uh, many anatomic variations and therefore we must carefully elevate this anatomic uh, structures. Firstly, we must evaluate the nervous vagus. Normally, the nervous vagus are uh, in the car. Normally, most of the patients is on the three o'clock, but sometimes it, it have different variations. I will show you on ultrasound images. Normally, we see on the ultrasound images the nervous vagus on the 3 o'clock. Sometimes it is on the 12 o'clock, but sometimes it is close to the thyroid parenchyme in 11 o'clock and 6 o'clock. If we see in uh, close to the thyroid parenchyme, in these cases, we have a high risk of thermal injury at the thermal ablation. In this case, we must use hydrodissection and separate the carotid artery from the thyroid gland. But this uh, classification is a good classification, but not 100% trustable classification, because sometimes while it, the nervous vagus is on the carotid seat, if we uh, search with the transuder from superior to inferior, the position are changed, it is mobile. Therefore, always it is uh, good uh, to do a hydro section between the carotid artery and thyroid gland. Second important anatomic uh, nerve is the middle sympathetic uh, nerve, middle sympathetic sympathetic trunk. It is normally lateral side of the carotid artery, but sometimes it is on the medial side, like here. Here is a big thyroid nodule, here's the carotid artery, and we see here a variation of middle sympathetic cervical trunk, and we must use here hydrosection. section. Another important uh, patient group is the history of total or subtotal thyroid hysterectomy. Hydrosection section should be performed in patients who will go undergo ablation, and in this group, the course of the recurrent laryngeal nerve change completely in this patient group. This is a Horner syndrome. In this patient, we have a complication, damage to the cervical sympathetic change, meiosis, pitosis, antidrosis. And uh, this is uh, one of my complications. Uh, in these cases, I have a right vocal cord paralysis. I use laryngeal ultrasound in every uh, patient. I learned this from an Indian anesthesia uh, research paper from your country. And then I try, it is very easy to learn uh, at the ablation or before the ablation and after the ablation, I always investigate the vocal cords with the laryngeal ultrasound. And you see here, the right vocal cords are don't moving, uh, but the left is uh, normal moving. And here we see a normal vocal cords moving. It is very important to do uh, this procedure at the ablation. Sometimes at the ablation or after the ablation, we have voice changes. 
Uh, every voice changes don't mean that the uh, patient have a thermal injury. Most of them are lidocaine effects. Some of them are recurrent lungar thermal injury. To uh, distinguish them, uh, we look always, if I uh, see in any patient a voice change, I look to the vocal cords. If the vocal cords are moving both, this means this is only lidocaine effect. But if we see a vocal cord uh, disorder, then we have a recurrent thermal injury. And if we have any injury, what can we do? I always have an emergency kit in my uh, department. And this is it's 20 cc cold, five person dextrose with 20 milligram methylpretins. It always keep it in the reprogrator really. And if we have a problem uh, with the voice, and if I see at the ultrasound, the vocal cord disorder, then I inject this mixture to the tracheoesophageal growth. If the patient say I have pitosis, if I see the uh, symptoms of Horner syndrome, pitosis sometimes is begin with pitosis, then I inject this uh, mixture around the nervous vagus. And in every cases, it's uh, the clinical findings improve in five and 10 minutes. Why? Because in surgery, uh, we, uh, if we have a complication with the nerve, we cut the nerve. But in thermal ablation, we don't cut the nerve. We only have some burning at the myelin layer of the nerve. Therefore, it is very easy to treat with this emergency kit of thermal nerve injuries. To avoid this complication, I mostly use in every case a side section. But in which cases must we do? The, this is a, a research paper from China, and the main uh, goal, uh, the conclusion of this paper is, if we see between the nodule and the anatomic structures uh, don't thyroid parenchyme, we must use hydrosection. And what can we use for hydrosection? Normally, we use crystalloid liquids. This is mostly dextrose, and but the problem is. Uh, the fluid absorption is very fast and the continuity of the safe hydrosection distance is short. Therefore, uh, this is a new technique from my department. We use colloid fluids, isoencoic liquids. Uh, one of them is 6% hydroxyl starch. This is volume. And normally, we use this in emergency department in hypovolemic shocks. But the advantage of colloid fluid is its absorption is very slow compared to crystalline thickness, and the continuity of the safe pilot section distance is low. This is an example from your clinical trial of with Voliva. We inject between the carotid artery and thyroid uh, nodule 20 cc Voliva, and the distance area, the heat section area is 4.9 millimeter. If we do hydrosection section uh, for a safe ablation, we must have minimum 3 millimeters hydrosection area, and after only 5 mm, 10 mm, and 20 mm, we have a safe area is continuity, while the absorption is very slow in uh, volume. Before ablation, uh, after this evaluation of the anatomic structure, the first step is perithyroidal anesthesia. We evaluate the strep muscle and the thyroid capsule, and between the strep muscle and thyroid capsule, we inject uh, lidocaine or pilocaine mostly 10 or 20 cc, and this make a perithyroidal anesthesia. I will give here an example with the video. In this video, I use the lateral approach. Firstly, I give and I use here uh, hydrosection. Uh, I inject for hydrosection always dextrose in the beginning, and we have a hydrosection uh, area between the carotid uh, artery and uh, thyroid nodule. Here is an example. I inject between the strep muscle and the thyroid capsule lidocaine. We do it again with the needle with a trans ismic approach. And, and we separate it. And then you, we see here the carotid artery is close to the uh, thyroid uh, nodule. And we use with the perpendicular approach uh, dextrose. We injected it with the dextrose. 
and try to separate from here. And if we inject dextrose, we have now a safe area. Here is another example. Firstly, with the needle, I inject lidocaine between the strep muscle and the thyroid capsule. Then I don't change the needle, only I change the hub and here inject hydro dextrose or hydro section. I will give an uh, example. Uh, we use in my hospital, most of the parathyroid adenomas we use for treatment, terminal ablation. This is a right parathyroid adenoma and the parathyroid hormone levels are very high. When we evaluate before ablation, it is close to the tracheoesophageal growth and close to the carotid artery. It is on a very dangerous situation because the, uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve are in the this area in the tracheoesophageal growth. And it's, what we do is, firstly, I use a needle perpendicular between the parathyroid adenoma and carotid and inject here dextrose. I separate them from carotid artery. And then the second step is I navigate the needle tip and inject below the parotid adenoma dextrose. Now we have between tracheoesophageal growth and parotid adenoma a safe hydrosection area. Sometimes I use the lateral approach, inject more dextrose here, as we see. And the last step is ablation and if we do a good hydrosection ablation is very easy in parathyroid adenomas. Parathyroid adenomas are very soft and ablation is only 15 seconds. And as we know, the half time of parathyroid hormone is one hour and only after one or two hours, the parathyroid hormone levels come to the normal levels. And here are uh, important info, uh, information, nodule filters that increase volume reduction rate. What mean this? The best candidates for thyroid ablation are firstly the spongiform ecostriper, spongiform nodules. Second, nodules with liquid components, nodules with intense peripheral and intranodal pattern vascularity, and soft nodules. I use in my department in every case shear wave elastography. It's, it's near sure the stiffness of the nodule. And we have a research, new research, and we found that the best. Uh, volume shrinkage rate is in the nodules that uh, stiffness is under 30 kilopascal. And another important factor is that affect the volume reduction rate is the technical factors. First are the operator skills and expense. Second, in microablation, we must use low watts, 20, between 20 and 30 watts to avoid carbonization and for higher volume reduction rate. And another important is uh, Mother is ablation of the peripheral margins of the thyroid node because the mostly regrowth point is here. Most of the arteries are from and try from the peripheral zone, and therefore, if we don't ablate the peripheral margin, most of the nodules are regrowing. Therefore, I use always hydrosection section to a better ablation of nodule margins. We use this formula for volume reduction rate. And in the research paper, the treatment goal is 50%, but in the clinical practice, it must be minimum 70%. And as we know, volume reduction rate is higher in cystic nodules than solid nodules, and the volume reduction rate increases as the stiffness value is decreases. And this is a uh, sentence from my new research paper. We found that if the shear wave elastography value above 60 kilopascal with macro calcification nodules, in these nodules, the volume reduction rate is below 50% and we don't must ablation do in this nodule type. Another important thing is the follow-up. Normally, uh, in the routine practice, we only measure two dimensions, but the follow-up we must do with volume. This is before ablation, uh, nodule 3, 3 and 3 centimeter and the volume is 14.2 ml. Patient come after one month, we measure again 3, 3, 2. If we see this, we don't see any difference, but if we calculate the volume, the volume is 9.4 ml and we have 33% shrinkage. 
And uh, this is my clinic uh, follow-up form. We uh, draw here the nodules and we write here the nodule volume, the nodule structures, if the nodule is solid, semi-solid, liquid, rich, nodule vascularity, the elastography value, which elastography, the cosmetic score, symptom score, which what we use, and the processing time. And uh, we follow every uh, patient's one, three, six, and 12 months. And we write the same things, only we add here the volume reduction rate. We use in thyroid ablation, the moving shot technique. And this is uh, a technique from uh, Dr. Professor Bai from Korea. Normally we use mostly the trans approach. Why? Because the danger triangle is here to avoid thermal injuries, but sometimes it depends on the position of the nodule. Sometimes we use lateral approach, or if the nodule is too deep, sometimes we use plenty of approach. It depends on your skills. Always we begin from the inferior part of the nodule. Uh, if we see a bubble, bubble, bubble means a destruction of the follicular uh, cells. We move slightly back, unit by unit, and if we see another bubbles, we go to a superior part. Why we begin from the posterior inferior part? Why don't we begin from superior? Because if we begin from superior, the shadows of the bubbles are closed anatomic vision. Therefore, always we must begin from the inferior to superior. And if we ablated uh, the danger uh, peripheric areas close to the uh, regular learning nerve, in this uh, parts, we must reduce the watt to 10 or 15 watts and must do the moving shot more faster to avoid thermal injuries. If we go to the middle of the nodules, then we can increase the watt to 30 and we can do the moving shot more slowly. And here we see an example of a thyroid nodule. We must always begin from the inferior to superior. We have two techniques. We use overlapping and moving shot. Normally we use this overlapping technique in liver, uh, mostly in liver uh, masses. Uh, in the beginning, I used the overlapping technique, but now we must use moving shot. What's the difference between this technique? In overlapping technique, we fix the antenna and wait. If we wait too much, the heat go out of the uh, margins of the tire node and we can have thermal injury. If we fix less time, then we cannot ablate the peripheral margins of the node. This is the disadvantage of overlapping technique. But in moving shot technique, we always move the thyroid ant the antenna and we ablated all the thyroid nodule and at one time, while we uh, always move, we have very low risk of thermal injury. Here is my first cases. In this cases, I use the overlapping technique and the uncooled micro te technology. This is our 950 megahertz old technology. And as we see, this is a thyroid nodule, and I don't cannot ablate it all the thyroid nodule, only a part of thyroid nodule. And we see here the carbonization channels because I fix it, I don't move it. And another important uh, thing is, if you if we use the overlapping technique, the string range of the nodule are not uniform, like here. And if this patient go to another physician like endocrinologist or radio, if he sees us, he thinks this is a popular microcarcinoma. But if we use for ablation the moving shot technique, the shrinkage is uniform like a nodule. Another important thing is we use in the classification of thyroid nodules normally the thyroids, and this is a new term, thyroids post therapeutic, because after ablation, the echogenity are more uh, less and the stiffness are more. Sometimes if the patient go to another physician, he thinks this is malign. Therefore, we must explain always the patients uh, after ablations, the, some uh, ultrasound features are changed. Here is an example from my patients. Patient have right lobe uh, placed 5.4 ml 
direct model be ablated after one month the we have a small shrinkage only the echogenital changes but after three months it's go to 3.75 ml and after six months it is under one ml and here is a one example for my cases firstly i inject here under the set muscle didocaine and this is a spongiform nodule richness then I go with my needle between the thy thyroid gland and carotid artery and inject uh, dextrose for hydrosection. And if I see the bubbles, I always move back. I don't fix my antenna there. Because if I fix my antenna, then occur carbonization and we can have thermal injuries. Therefore, uh, if I see the bubbles, I go slowly back. And what we see is with the bubbles is uh, the destruction of the follicular cells and coagulative necrosis. This is a, another uh, example. I inject here dextrose, and now we have a very uh, safe hydrosection. Uh, then we begin always from the posterior inferior part of the nodule. And if I see the bubbles, I always move back. And if I finish this, then I go to the superior part and to the middle part of the body. Another important uh, patient group is toxic adenomas, thermal ablation of toxic adenomas. And the best thing is uh, after ablation of toxic adenomas, most of the patients are, don't need any antithyroidal uh, medicaments, they are stopped. But the important thing, if we chose a toxic adenoma group, it must be don't larger than 12 ml. In this mean is not be, be it must be bigger than three centimeters. In this group, sometimes we cannot ablate it very well. Therefore, there are two research papers of it from Italy, and they found the same things larger than 12 uh, ml the success rate are lower and therefore it is very important uh, to uh, if we select patients it must be under 12 or 13 ml this is one of my patients and uh, the volume of the toxic adenoma is 10 ml it is very hypervascular and you see here the video of here very hypervascular thyroid nodule. and after ablation we don't see any vascularization and totally it is finished and we see here another toxic adenoma very hypervascular we ablate it here after ablation we don't see any hypervascularization before ablation the hormone results of the uh, patients was the thyroid hormone was very depressed only after two weeks it is totally normal and the patient stopped the, medic uh, the medicaments here is another example. This is a young lady. She has uh, parathyroid adenoma and very high levels. This case was an interesting case for me. It is the most big parathyroid adenoma that I treat. It was four centimeters length and four, three and two centimeter big parathyroid adenoma. In parathyroid adenoma ablation, firstly, it is very important ablation of the polar artery. Polar artery arises from the inferior thyroid artery and, and try from here to the parathyroid adenoma. If we don't uh, ablate the, uh, the polar artery, every time it's recurrence. Therefore, we must ablate this. What I do is I go with my needle between the carotid artery and jugular artery, and then I inject here dextrose under the we see here parathyroid adenoma, and now we have here a safe zone. Uh, parathyroid adenoma stiffness are around 15 kilopascal. There are very soft uh, anatomic uh, structures, and ablation is very uh, fast in these cases. And then we begin to ablation parathyroid adenoma. And after ablation, this is before ablation. And after ablation, we see that all the destruction of the parathyroid adenoma. And this is the color doppler. We don't see the polar artery. We ablate it. 
and we check after ablation always the vocal cord that we don't have a, a recurrent nerve, nerve uh, injury. And uh, follow up after parathormone is only after two weeks. If we look uh, to the laboratory results, it is 25. It is totally resolved. We use uh, thermal ablation since two years in malignant uh, lesion in popular microcarcinomas. And the American Joint Committee of Cancer accepts uh, under one centimeter T1A. Uh, between one and two centimeters to one B, and in some other guidelines they say uh, active follow in T one A and T one B, or in low risk popular microcast we can follow it with active surveillance, but uh, the state they stated that the main factors determining the prognosis regards of the size are pathologic features and extra thyroid extension. Therefore, we must firstly learn the aggressive variants of popular thyroid cancer. Firstly, the tall cell variant. Compared to the classic form, the recurrence rates in tall cell variant is high, and it has worse surveillance. Therefore, in this variant, we have 80% of the cases extra thyroid extension and lymph node metastasis. Therefore, if we have a tall cell variant, we must never ablate it. Another uh, variant is hopnail and columnar variant. We have in this variant special lung uh, metastasis. And this, uh, this two variant is not suitable cases for ablations. And this is the uh, clinical practice guideline for use of universal treatment in malignant thyroid lesion from the European Thyroid Association and the Cardiovascular and Intervention uh, Radiology Society. And they say that we if we do image gated thermal ablation in thyroid malignancy, should be evaluated by the multidisciplinary team, including experts from traditional and image gated intervention treatment modalities. And we use thermal ablations in popular microcarcinomas, unresectable thyroid cancer, in neck lymph node recurrence of different thyroid carcinomas, and in distant metastasis. And uh, in these types, we don't must do in this future ablation. One is the suspicion of aggressive subtypes of thyroid carcinoma, top cell, insular, and columnar cell. If we have extra thyroid growth and multiple neoplastic focus, or if we have presence of lymph node or distant metastasis, in these cases, we must not do popular, we must not do uh, thermal ablation. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Mr. Jose, could you could you mute your your voice? You are interrupting. Sorry, sorry. Can, uh, you, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, sir. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Second is uh, important. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis. In this meta-analysis, we compare thermal ablation with surgery in low-risk popular thyroid uh, microcarcinomas. The diameters, here is the surgery uh, group. The diameters are the same diameters. And if we look to the results of surgery and ablation, local recurrence after surgery is, of course, zero. And we have no local recurrence after ablation. It's the same. After surgery, in some cases, we have lymph node metastasis at the same ratio in ablation. And the risky surgery is in after the surgery group, totally three in the ablation group for same results. And here will I give an example from my cases. This is right ismic and right lobe uh, placed popular microcarcinoma, seven millimeters before ablation. I inject between trachea and thyroid gland dextrose. Then I do a peritoidal ablation and only in five and 10 seconds be ablated. But it is very important to ablate a safe zone. Therefore, this is another case. This is seven millimeters, but uh, we ablated with very wide area to make a safe zone. And after three months, it's it's shrinkage and mostly if the thyroid popular microcarcinoma size is under 15 millimeters, 
99% of them are resolved in the ultrasound images after three, three months. And this is one of my cases, uh, left thyroid blood placed papillary microcarcinoma. It is 10.9 millimeters and it is close to the carotid artery. What we do is we inject here dextrose and we separate them from the carotid artery and then we ablate it here, both of them. We ablate it very uh, wide and after ablations, we see here, after one hour, I uh, look the patient again and this is before ablation and after the ablation, as we see, we ablate it very wide uh, area to make the safe zone. Microme ablation of metastatic lymph nodes, prior of to ablation, we inject a mixture of 10 or 20 cc of uh, lidocaine and dextrose with a one-to-one -one ratio around the metastatic lymph node to make the hydrosection and uh, anesthesia. Uh, and uh, very interesting sign is we found this, Leaf net nodes have a natural capsule structure that inhibits hint contraction, and when ablation is performed, the temperature inside the lymph node is relatively high, while the temperature outside the lymph node is relatively low, which can reduce the complication. Therefore, lymph node ablation is more safe than thyroid ablation. And I will give you some examples. This is a case. It is close to the jugular vein and carotid artery is a metastatic lymph node. Firstly, uh, we do the hydrosection around the lymph node with a, this mixture with uh, dextrose and lidocaine mixture. And after that, we begin uh, with the moving shot technique to ablations. And after ablation, we have many cases, and we, if we ablate it completely, we have never a recurrence in these cases. And especially in oncologic patients, it is uh, very comfortable for the patients because most of the patients have not a good conditions, and neck, dissection, neck dissections are sometimes very traumatic for this patient group. And here is another uh, patient's uh, Metastatic lymph node. Firstly, we give peri peri uh, lymph node anesthesia and hydrosection. And after that, we uh, go inside with the antenna and then we ablate it only in five seconds and it's finished. Most uh, of the uh, it's a frequently questioned what is the histopathologic change after thermal ablations, and this is a paper from China. They uh, do in 69 uh, biopsy, core needle biopsy tissue samples from the ablation area of thyroid nodes in 60 paper. And then uh, they take this from different stage and from different areas, and they do this in one month, three months, six months, and 12 months. What they found is this. This is very important information. They found only coagulated degeneration in the freshly ablated thyroid tissue, and no necrosis is found. Necrosis occurs and progresses to the whole ablation array in all patients, and it is suggests that the reliable therapeutic effect of microbial on thyroid nodes is to the complete necrosis. And they found that necrosis occurs in all the ablation area at six months after microablation. This means sometimes we need a second season of thermal ablation, but we must always wait minimum six months to occur all the necrosis in the thyroid node. Here is another paper from Korea, and in this paper they uh, does radiofrequency induced neuroplastic change in benign thyroid nodules. Most of the patients or clinicians uh, ask these questions and they do the same things. They do true cut biopsy and after histopathologic examination, they only see a cellular ionization. And this is an example from the literature, not my case. It's a liquid rich lesion. It is 85 ml and after uh, aspirated fluid and ablation, it is 7 ml. This both women and my cases, 
uh, in these cases I do uh, two seasons both sides and she have 165 ml and after ablations only four months it is 35 ml and uh, approximately 80 percent uh, shrinkage and in this case we have the left sided uh, spongiform nodule 32 cc and only after three months we have 88 percent volume reduction rate and we see here 90 cc right sided spongiform nodule and after three months 3.5 96 percent it shrinkage this mean in this examples show you if we chose right nodules, we have good results. Therefore, the selection of the thyroid nodules are very important. This is a Nigerian descent patient. She is an animator in the uh, hotels in Antalya, and she has very big nodules, 156 ml. And after ablation, after four months, it is 21 ml. And here we see after thyroidectomy, and here a picture after thyroid ablation, only one needle insertion. And finally, what is the advantage of thyroid ablation? Firstly, the thyroid gland is protected. We know if we do sometimes subtotal thyroidotomy, uh, one uh, in this cases, 70% of these cases need uh, thyroid replacement uh, therapy. In thyroid ablation, patients do not need lifelong thyroid replacement therapy, no incision scars on the skin. It is outpatient procedure. Maximum after two hours, we discharge the patients. It is very minimal invasive. And uh, we only use mostly local anesthesia, rarely sedonazizine. And this is uh, Antalya, my uh, count, uh, city. Now I will share you recorded case that I perform all the procedure which medicament I use it take five minutes only yes. this is a May uh, 20, 20 uh, 72 years old uh, man he have a very big uh, nodule, 27.8. It was a liquid rich, semi solids And if we look to the color doppler, it was a strong arterial supply and it was a soft nodule while it is under, in shallow elastography, under 30 kilopascal, but it's close to nervous vagus. Before ablation, I always uh, prepare uh, 20 or 40 cc dextrose, it is ready for uh, hydrosection, and I use prilocaine. Firstly, we measure the dimensions of the nodule, then I look to the nervous vagus, but I said before, if we go with the transfer from superior to inferior, the uh, position of the nervous vagus changes. It is a very hypervascular nodule. This mean this is a growing nodule. It has a potential of growing in the future. Then I measure with shear elastography from the solid parts of the nodule. It is uh, 13 kilopascal, very soft nodule. Firstly, I go with the needle under the strap muscle and inject here prilocaine and separate uh, the strap muscle from the thyroid capsule. It has two advantages, not only peritoneal anesthesia. Secondly, if the patient has in the future uh, surgery, we avoid from here the adhesions. Then I go with the needle between the carotid artery and the thyroid nodule and inject here Dextrose. After that, I use, uh, I measure this area. This area must be minimum 23.5 uh, uh, millimeters. 
Uh, I always aspirate uh, the fluids before ablations because it is very difficult to ablate it to the fluid uh, parts. I ablate, I ablate that. We measure the uh, hydrosection area. It is 12 mm, very uh, wide. And sometimes the, uh, I try always to inject fluid to posterior inferior part of the Nodule, you see here is the danger triangle, and we have here a 5.7 millimeters hydrosection area. We have now safe. Then I go with the needle inside. While it is a very uh, soft nodule, ablation is very uh, fast. So I go uh, very. If I see the bubbles, I don't stay there and I go back. And here we see uh, another very advantage of microablation. In RFA, if you ablated any area, the heat go two millimeters forward of the antenna. And sometimes, therefore, we have sometimes thermal injuries. But in microablation, you can go with the antenna to the border uh, completely to the margin of the nodule, like here, and the bubbles, the heat go back, not forward. And this is very safe at the ablation procedure. Now I go more for ablated, ablated. Okay, after ablation, we check it now. As we see, we ablated com completely and the safe area are continued. This is very important. And if we uh, look here, uh, high section area between the carotid artery and thyroid nodule complex, we ablated totally all the parts of the nodules. Okay. And always, uh, I measure after ablation because in, after every cases, uh, 10 or 15 uh, percent is shrinkage directly. We control with the color Doppler and shear elastography. We see uh, not any uh, vascularization after ablation. And this is very, very important here. After every ablation, I uh, give from the, I inject 120 milligram methyl prednisolone intravenous. Why? Two reasons. Two, uh, it has a very good anti edema effect and the patient feel good. I send one gram paracetamol IV intision and I use one hour ice pack. This is methylprednisolone and paracetamol. And here are the ice packs after ablation. And uh, at the discharge, I always uh, order uh, five days amoxicillin clavinate and uh, three days diclofenac sodium for the anti inflammatory effect. And this is what I share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Blunt. Thank you for your sharing. Uh, and your colleagues from CMC Hospital.